Welcome uh, to my talk on hole punching in the wild. Um, it's a small disclaimer here. We gave this talk previously at FOSDEM in 2023, so this year actually. Um, but I thought maybe this is actually useful for this audience as well um, to hear this talk or is this talk in a similar way um, as like a lot of work went into general like um, hole punching measurements and hole punching in general uh, in Lippi2P. And uh, so just kind of carrying this information to this audience as well. Uh, cool. So what I want to talk about is um, Lippi2P. Lippi2P's hole punching mechanism. We'll go into what hole punching actually is. And then hole punching deployed onto the IPFS network or other networks. And then uh, last step being measuring the success rate of this hole punching mechanism of Lippi2P. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, we did this together, or actually there's a third person as well, which is Elena, um, uh, building the, the whole project uh, around measuring hole punching. And then uh, Dennis collected a lot of data, co um, um, executed the whole measurement campaign and so on. Yanis also helped a lot on the measurement campaign and collected all the data. Um, I'm still listing Dennis here as we uh, prepared the talk together, uh, but unfortunately Dennis can't make it today. Um, short introduction for myself, Max, software engineer at Protocol Labs. Uh, maintaining lippi 2 uh, among many others, of course. Okay, let's look quickly on the agenda. Like, I would like to give a very brief intro to lippi 2 even though I would guess most people are already familiar here. Um, then talk a little bit about the problems that we're actually facing in lippi 2 which is firewalls and NATs. Um, we're facing many other problems as well, but we're, we'll not focus on those uh, here today. Uh, the holy solution, or the, in, the biggest hack of the internet, called hole punching, and then how we measured this, and what are kind of the takeaways from this larger measurement campaign. Okay, cool. Um, again, short show of hands, who here has ever used lippi 2 Okay. Cool. Anyone that used IPF, IPFS obviously also used lippi 2 um, So lippi 2 peer-to-peer networking library, one specification then implemented in many different languages. Um, it provides low-level features um, like encryption, authentication, uh, and hole punching, which we're going to talk uh, about today. And then higher-level features like, for example, DHT, a distributed hash table, or gossiping protocols that then build on those lower layers that we built. Okay. And then, in general, I would say Lippi2P is all you need or should be all you need uh, to build a peer-to-peer -peer application. Okay. Um, so we're going to focus on um, hole punching. And uh, while, why do we need hole punching in the first place? Um, well, we want within the Lippi2P network, uh, we want full connectivity among all nodes, or at least we want to strive towards full connectivity. And uh, in today's internet, the biggest barrier to full connectivity is uh, on the one side browsers, which we'll not talk about today, and then on the other side, uh, NATs and firewalls. Um, yeah, so we somehow have to overcome NATs and firewalls to then actually achieve full connectivity within a lipid bean network. Cool, um, yeah, not gonna go dive deep into what are NATs and firewalls. NATs, network address translators, um, they go from a simplified, from a local public IP uh, to a public IP, right? They do this mapping. And then firewalls, um, small disclaimer, I'm not advocating for all of you to turn off your firewalls, please don't do that. But um, the firewalls have a very important role. They protect you from outside traffic, right? And in most cases, you actually don't want anyone to be able to connect to you. You actually don't want that full connectivity. Uh, but in our case, we do want that. Um, then the one thing that we're going to work with today during the talk is um, the, the NAT table. Um, you, it's just a representation, right? Every model is wrong, but this is actually useful. Um, you have a table of five tuples, uh, source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and then the transport protocol. And every router, or in most cases, the NATs and firewalls are actually in the router. Every router keeps track of this table. And we need this later on uh, to do the hole punching. Cool, so what is the problem? Um, by the way, in case you find these graphs fancy, none of them were created by me, all of them were created by Dennis. Um, so let's say A wants to connect to B, so A sends a packet to B. Um, that will add an entry on the very left to its routing table, right? Uh, to its NAT mapping table. 
Um, and then the packet will make it through the internet somehow, right? It's routed through the internet, and then make it makes it to router B, and router B will check its table um, and discard it because it has never seen any packet come going from B to A. So it will think that this packet is coming from an attacker, right? Or from some malicious source out there. So better to drop it, and that's that's a good feature of a firewall, right? So how can we overcome this in situations where we actually want those two be able to connect to each other? So let's say we have some mechanism. We'll go into what that mechanism is. But let's say we have some mechanism that will have A and B start a process at the same time, right? So let's say, let's go. A and B both send a packet at the same time. That packet traverses their routers. That adds entries to their tables. And uh, those packets somehow meet in the middle, go the other way, end up at the other person's router, and ta-da, you have entries in each of these tables, and the routers will let the packets go through, right? And this process is called hole punching, where A punches a hole into its own router so that the packet from B can make it through that hole into um, node A. Okay, again, very much simplified, right? There's a lot more details to this, but uh, I think this is helpful here. Okay, so now I, I talked about this magic process, right? Um, how can we achieve that A and B start this process at the same time, right? How do we achieve that they both send the packet at the same time? Um, in Lib2P world, this is called DCUTR, um, decoder by some, and uh, direct connection upgrade through relay. Don't, don't remember the name, that's fine. Um, in other, um, in other protocols, like for example, WebRTC, you do this coordination over a turn, for example. So how do we synchronize somehow? Well, in lib 2 p uh, we first introduce a relay. So we have both A and B connect to the relay node. And then we at least have a relayed way to communicate with each other. Um, and what we want to achieve now is a direct connection between the two nodes. So um, once we have the relay connection, um, B will send a connect message to A, um, and will actually start a timer. See this up here. Um, it's, it will start measuring the round trip time. Um, the connect will go through the relay connection. Again, we don't have a direct connection yet. Um, it will arrive at A, and A will send a connect back. So at this point, uh, you can see that B knows roughly the round trip time between B and A over the relay. What it will do now, it will send a sync message, and it will wait half a round trip time. So half a round trip time is exactly the time the sync message will need it to A, right? And after half a round trip time, B will start the hole punching, and when A receives the sync, it will start the hole punching. So ta-da, we have our magical mechanism that actually synchronizes the two and have them uh, do hole punching at the same time, at the same time. So then um, the packets are sent out at the same time, they traverse somewhere in the internet, they make it to the other side, and ta-da, they make it through the routers, and this way we actually achieved a hole punch. Okay, cool. Uh, so that's how we do hole punching uh, in Lib2P. And hole punching is not specific to Lib2P. We're definitely not the in inventors of, in my eyes, the biggest hack of the internet. Um, this has probably been done before 2008, I'm very sure. But uh, the, the most official reference I've uh, found is an RFC 5128. It's actually quite amusing to see this fully documented. Um, Implementations in Lib2P started before 2021, but since 2021, between 2021 and 2022, we have been specifying most of the protocols and then implementing uh, both protocols in Go and Rust. At FOSDEM last year, we actually uh, announced, or not announced, but we talked about most of this, um, and then started rolling this out on the IPFS network um, in roughly summer 2022. And well, rolling this out is one step, but the next step is how can we actually make sure this works properly, right? And um, for that, um, Dennis uh, organized the so-called hole punching month where um, we tried to measure how well is hole punching actually working across the many networks that are um, using IPFS. 
All right, so how do you measure hole punching? Well, what we could do is just uh, have one colleague um, run their laptop, have me run my laptop, right? And then we do hole punching. But now there is so much complexity in here. Like, how does my laptop's network stack look like, right? How does my internal network look like? What is my router? What's the NAT behavior of my router? What's the firewall of my router? What is, what is my ISP? How fast does my ISP route to the other ISP? And then everything mirrored on the other side as well, right? So there's so much complexity that if we simply test it between two endpoints, we'll get one data point, but that data point is pretty much useless as the internet is so diverse out there. So we set out for something different. We had many ideas. This is the simplest solution, I would say. Um, what we first do is we have a honeypot. Uh, so you can think of this as uh, in the concept in the security world. So we have a DHT server in the IPFS network that simply um, tries to attract uh, other nodes. And among those nodes are nodes behind firewalls and NATs, right? Just standard IPFS users out there. Um, now, these users announce themselves to the network, right, and somehow come across our honeypot, right? Given the Kademlia DHT, they will at some point connect to it. And the honeypot will forward um, those connection information of those nodes behind NATs and firewalls to a database. And then on the other side of the database, we have a server which kind of exposes this data um, to our clients. Now, the clients are special hole punching month clients. Um, we built this um, in Go and Rust, and we asked many people to deploy a small little binary, a small client, in their network, and had just have it running for long term. And what the clients do, those are not IPFS clients, so those are very uh, spec down clients. What the clients do, they connect to the server, get addresses of a bunch of other IPFS nodes out there that are behind firewalls and NATs, they will try to connect to the relay node of those IPFS clients behind firewalls and NATs. And then they will actually try to do a hole punch between those. And what they are then going to do is report the result back to the server. And this way, we pretty much tested um, hole punching across the entire globe. Um, so this graph shows uh, in which countries we actually had those hole punching clients, right? So not real IPFS clients, but specced down clients uh, of people running in their home networks. Um, and these are the remote clients, so the standard IPFS clients running behind uh, NATs and firewalls. And so we basically punch holes in the direction from the puncher clients down to the remote peers. Um, yeah, a couple more things. So it roughly went for a month. Uh, we have above 6 million hole punches. Um, we have roughly 150 clients. So those clients that run into people's network who, where we asked, hey, can you please deploy this client in your network for a longer period of time? And then um, the, we're roughly talking about 50K peers uh, that we punched to. All right, so um, overall success rate, um, to summarize in one number, is roughly 70%. So 70% success rate to uh, establish a direct connection between two peers behind firewalls or NATs on the IPFS network. Um, but there is a lot more to this, and I kind of want to um, draw attention to a couple of the details. So probably the most interesting one is uh, success rate. So what you see here on the left is uh, the number of networks, and then um, towards the right, uh, the, the success rate. And uh, what you can see is, well, we have some networks on the very left where simply success rate is zero, right? Um, this could, for example, be symmetric nets. I can go into detail what that is. We simply can't hole punch those at the moment. Um, but what you can also see is that um, we have a big chunk of networks where actually success rate is very high, right? You see the big spike. So that's very promising to continue doing all punching. Then how does this relate to TCP and um, QUIC? Um, there is a lot more detail to this, but surprisingly, we haven't seen a big distinction between the two. We would have expected um, QUIC, given that it's UDP, and given that thus the NAT behavior is very different, to outperform uh, TCP by a big chunk, but we haven't seen that. And then we seem to have some problems on IPv6, um, but. Uh, we haven't really dug deep into why we have such a low success rate on IPv6 across TCP and QUIC. 
All right, so um, this is a very, very misleading chart, I would say. So you would think that, well, 80% of the successes, whole punch successes were quick, and 18.9 uh, were TCP. That is correct, um, but if two peers try to connect to each other, right? They, we will raise different transports. So we'll connect over TCP and quick at the same time. And well, maybe the TCP connection succeeded, but we actually don't know because quick is so much faster, right? At the handshake, right? It only needs one round trip or yeah, one round trip for the handshake that we simply, quick is just the fastest. And at some point, uh, once we have one connection established, we just don't bother about the TCP connection anymore. So yes, Quick is widely outperforming here at TCP, um, but this is due to the fact that Quick is simply faster at reporting a successful result of a whole punch. Maybe the TCP connections would have succeeded, but uh, we don't know at this point. Cool, another complexity is the virtual private networks. Um, the problem here is that in, in general, you would think that you're, as your laptop, you're very close to your router, to your home router, right? You would think of like at most one milliseconds or something. Um, but in the case of virtual uh, VPNs, you, your exit point's very far away. So that screws with a lot of the measurements that we do. You remember earlier this magic mechanism that I said where like, um, um, yeah, we, we try to time the two endpoints to hole punch at the same time, right? This is very difficult on VPNs because the part that you want to hole punch is not right next to you, but a lot further away. And in case that's very much further away, the whole punch will not succeed. So that's why we have a significantly less success rate on uh, virtual private networks. Um, another uh, takeaway is what we do in hole punching is we don't try once, but we try multiple times. So in total, we try three times to hole punch to a remote peer. And what the measurements pretty much show is in case it didn't succeed on the first try, like there's no reason to try again. But I'll add a little caveat in a little bit. So that's definitely a learning and we can make uh, uh, skip the other two. And then uh, lastly, what I would have expected is that the round trip time to the relay really matters. So for example, if two nodes within Europe want to hole punch, I would have expected that the round trip time, in case the relay is in the US, that this really matters. But we haven't really found a correlation between the round trip time to the relay and the round trip time um, whether the round trip time through the relay really matters in terms of success rate uh, on a whole punch ring. That was quite a surprise. I would have expected, given that the two European nodes are, that they're right next to each other, that um, this is quite a problem with the US relay because any timing problems that can happen on such a long path really screw up uh, our timing between the two European nodes. All right, so next steps, a couple of learnings. Uh, well, we need to reconsider the retries. Then on quick, um, we can actually still do the retries. What we're currently doing is one tries to establish a connection and the other one just sends garbage. In case one of the two is a symmetric net, we should try doing it the other way around. So one sending the garbage and one trying to establish the connection. So we'll probably have higher success right there. And then we can probably do some optimizations around um, RTT measurements, better RTT measurements, not to the remote peer, but actually as well to our gateway. So this way, if we could, for example, discover that we are in a VPN where our exit node, uh, well, the VPN exit node is very far away. So the thing that we need to hole punch is further away than the standard router. All right, um, the entire data analysis, again, uh, done by Dennis, I would assume that this available in case people are interested in the data. Um, not, I don't think it's available publicly, but I would guess, like reach out in case you're interested in this large chunk of data. Um, and um, yeah, we still have to uh, root cause a lot of things on this. Cool, um, we published a paper on decentralized hole punching. So how does uh, hole punching work in Lipid2P? Um, main author here is Martin. And then, um, since then, Dennis wrote up a very extensive uh, report on all of the measurement data. So if you want to check out that part, I think over the GitHub repository is the best way to find it, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so just go to protocol slash network measurements and you find a bunch of really good, in my eyes, uh, requests for measurement reports there. And one of them is the whole punching measurement report uh, going into every detail of the data. Right, that's all from my house.
side. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions on hole punching? So Max. So um, is the is the timing on UDP packet response traversal so fine grained that the sync packet is necessary? Do you know what I mean? Like you said, you had to send the sync because you're trying to get the endpoints to time their hole punch. What is the typical timeout on a NAT firewall where it will allow an inbound packet, you know, as yeah. a response rather than reject it? Like, what is that timing? Is the sync packet actually necessary? Yeah. So the sync mechanism we mostly build to hole punch for TCP. If we have the sync anyways, might as well use it for UDP as well. But probably the WebRTC way would be the better one if we just would be doing UDP where we just, yeah, just shoot a bunch of UDP packets out in this way um, punch holes into our own net. Right, because in your measurements, did you, I don't know how you would track it, but did you track the sync packet failing to get to the other side and ah. therefore the other side didn't try to hole punch back and that is like a source of false uh, negatives? So the sync packet would never fail in that sense, given that we have retransmits on our transport layer, but that makes it even worse, right? Because right. retransmits screw up your entire measurement. Uh, we have not gone into that, no. Sure. Yeah. And, and you said they ha you haven't done any root causing on the IPv6 stuff? No, we haven't. Yeah, I would, I would guess it's a silly mistake on our end. Mm. It might even just be in our puncher clients. We haven't. Mm. I just wanted to disclose it here. It's like, it's Great talk, data. though, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else, any nitty gritty details about NATs? <laughs> uh, one question regarding the relays. Yeah. Uh, you said you would have expected that relays in the US mm -hmm. make a difference, Yeah. right? But really the packet only needs to go make it out of my router and to the relay before the other one comes back. So I guess if the relay is very far apart, um, like that, that time to the router is so much shorter than to the relay that probably by the time you do it, you're, you're telling the other party to start, your packet already made it out of the router, yeah. even if it already made it to the other side. Right? Well, it already made it out of your router, but it might have also already made it into the other person's router, even though they don't yet know whether we're doing hole punching or not. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. So it's like, yes, uh, like, uh, can I show this somewhere? So we do the relay, right? We do the connect, then we do the sync, Right? We have the sync, and let's say the relay is so far away that actually this sync, the, the packet from B actually overtakes the sync and makes it to A's router first. Right? And then A's router is like, I don't have a, an entry for this. I'll drop the packet. So yeah, I would still expect this to be problematic, but we haven't found it in the data. Doesn't mean, what do you say? like? Uh, missing uh, proof of existence doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? Yeah. You had another question. Yeah, it was in the same direction. Uh, I was thinking that it would be beneficial for the VPNs uh, to purposely choose a relay in the US. Mm -hmm. ah. Why? To be far away enough. Yeah, to, to increase uh, the delay after your exit point. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So just to repeat, like uh, the idea is to pick up a far relay yeah. um, uh, in case you're v behind a VPN. Yeah. yeah. So so you make the first attempt, you see it fails. Usually you would say, okay, another attempt wouldn't help. Yeah. But then purposely pick a relay with higher latency further away to make up for it. Yeah. Or wait a little bit after you sync. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably easier. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. At this point, I, I think we should do like try mostly like really buckle down on UDP and just send a constant stream of UDP packets both directions and hope that one of them makes it. Yeah. But <laughs> thanks. Cool. Um, I have a quick question. So after uh, after this great study that we did and. Um, all of the stuff that you've built together with Dennis and everyone. Like, what is the, um, how did the results change 
what you would do with Nat Hole Punching in Lee B2B. What are, did you change course of action? Do you have any extra items that you now want to fix for the next release? Like, yeah. yeah. Okay, so one thing that was super helpful. So in general, Go Lippity was very much ahead on hole punching. And what we could actually do on the Rust side is, well, we basically had free hole punching partners through this architecture, right? right? Because we could test against all of the IPFS nodes that are behind firewalls and NATs uh, due to this honeypot architecture. So this led to finding many things on the Rust Lippity P side where we could actually do optimizations. Like we were not choosing our um, uh, Audinat servers correctly. Uh, we were not, yeah, a couple, I have to look them up, but we did a bunch of things. So that was definitely very fruitful. Then I would guess that um, this retry mechanism here on UDP hole punching will be fruitful, but we haven't actually uh, investigated this one. Um, and then uh, I think just discovering the fact that we have difficulties on IPv6 um, will be fruitful, but again, we haven't. That's weird. This do we do we know yet? Can I, I, I don't know. I yeah. also don't want to give it too much attention. Maybe it's just a silly bug in yeah, our implementation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, what protocols are keeping libp 2 p firmly in the supporting TCP? Ah, uh, some ISPs drop UDP. Just by default? Yeah, there's nothing good coming in through UDP. <laughs> That's but, interesting. I mean, in the past, right? Um, obviously. Yeah, I, know, I get that. Time. I'm just saying, but right now, like, is it really just TLS, HTTP? Like, I mean, are these... So, like, literally still ISPs drop UDP packets, so we can't run quick in, in those networks. How... And, so big is that? So this, oh, no, wait, sorry, I don't I, want to derail I, this. I think it's this. somewhere within the 5% ballpark, but this could be completely off. Like, it's definitely something that is still relevant, for example, at the ITF and still considered. No, I'm not saying it's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering how hard we can push the Web3 part of this. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Anyway, cool. Thank you.